All right, it is 2.27, couple minutes late. Uh, welcome everyone in class and online for the last class of this inaugural session of, of the O'Grain Seminar. Thank you for sticking with us this long. Uh, it's been a long journey, and uh, I'm grateful you guys have been here for the whole time. Um, today we have Sam Razor and Bruce Roskins from Grain Millers. Um, and Grain Millers, for over 20 years, uh, has been a leading manufacturer of conventional and organic grain ingredients uh, that's used in cereals, breads, bars, and many other products. They both uh, process and buy uh, oats, wheat, barley, and rye. This process into flours, flakes, brands, and fibers. Um, and from their website, this is good for all of you guys that are uh, going to be or already are growing organic grain. They say, as a major producer of certified organic products, both food and feed, we're always on the lookout for farmers who can supply quality organic grains. Um, so they're a big buyer. They're looking. Uh, and they will also, among other things, talk to you today about how to be uh, a good, uh, predictable quality supplier of grains uh, to a company like theirs. So, uh, without further ado, I will give them the floor. First, we have Sam Razor. Hi. Thanks for having us. Uh, definitely really appreciate it. Uh, really appreciate being out here and uh, able to talk to uh, to anybody who's listening or willing to listen to us uh, jabber, jabber on about oats. So, um, we will probably focus mainly on oats today. Uh, I believe the last couple days you had... Uh, uh, a wheat, more on wheat, uh, and and that's fine because uh, oats really is our bread and butter. So, uh, in, in perspective, uh, we mill as many, if not more, oats than uh, what Quaker does. Uh, but on the store shelf, we don't have a brand, so you're not seeing our brand on the store shelf. Uh, but if you are eating something that's not um, labeled Quaker or uh, even through General Mills products, uh, there's a good chance it came from us. Uh, for example, products that you'll see of ours on the store shelf would be uh, the nine grain blends that Subway has. Those nine grains come from our facilities, uh, primarily in St. Ansgar, Iowa, where we're, where we're making those blends. Uh, Cliff Bar is another big customer of ours. Uh, if you see any oat products in the Cliff Bar, it's a really good chance it came from us. Um, Cascadian Farms, which is a General Mills brand, um, we're doing a lot of the processing processing for them as well. If they have oat products in there, so as as a as a start, that just kind of hopefully that maybe brings it down to like what who we are as a company. But we'll get in a little bit more into it here as well. So I'm Sam. I run or manage our organic oat position and then some of our other organic grains as well. I do a little bit with conventional oats, uh, but my focus definitely is around our organic production, uh, which in the last three years has grown at a rate of five years. Let's go back five years. It's grown at a rate of 10% plus per year, where our conventional business grows at 1% at the most year over year our organic business has grown 10% consistently. I mean, and, and maybe some years even higher than that. So uh, it gets a lot of attention because where are you going to focus on the 1% or the 10%? You're going to focus on the 10% quite a bit. So Bruce and I have spent a lot of time on the road, uh, not not even together. We, we divide and conquer, but we've spent a lot of time on the road together as well. All right, short course, and I'm rambling. So... Uh, let's do a little name that product. These are going to be products that you're going to see in a store. Uh, it could be as is or in another product. What do you think this is? And I'll I'll start with it's an oat product. But what do you think this product would be? Bingo. You get a hat. <laughs> the the answer to that was steel cut oats. All right. What's this one? Rolled oats. Rolled oats, but maybe get a little bit more specific. Where would you see this in a... In a cereal box. <laughs> cereal box, all right, that's good. Yeah, you're a winner. <laughs> uh, so this is an instant oat. Uh, and an instant oat is uh, essentially your steel cuts but flaked. Right? Yep. Right. All right, how about this one?
Snake. What'd you say? Rolled. Rolled, yeah, okay. It it is it's it's they're all rolled oats. Uh, the what what you'll see on the store shelf of the, on this one is going to be an old fashioned. So this is your old fashioned oats, which uh, historically they take a little bit longer to cook, but uh, with more modern technology and research, uh, you know we've been able to get the cook times down on this. So you're not sitting over a stove for 40 minutes. Same with the steel cuts as well. Uh, technology has definitely advanced that, where you can eat more of an instant oat. Very good. Uh, I'm not going to get into this. Uh, this definitely shows uh, since the 1980s, early 1980s, we as a company started <laughs> with uh, uh, two brothers who are from Sweden, uh, came over to the U.S., and they started uh, 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 an oat milling company in Eugene, Oregon. And uh, over the years, they worked with uh, with oats, and there's a group of traders in the Midwest here, five guys that uh, were supplying them with oats, and essentially those two companies came together to, to make this company called Grain Millers today. Um, the family members are all still very involved. It is still very much a family-oriented company. Um, I work with... Uh, a lot of the second generation and, and first generation on an everyday basis. Um, so very privately held. Uh, and they do invest, as you can see over the years, uh, a lot of the money that they have made does not go into the, uh, into the principal's pocket. It goes back into the company. Uh, so we've seen just fantastic growth over the years. Uh, some of the major ones that you'll see on here is we bought a corn mill in Marion, Indiana. Uh, that has been a fantastic business for us. That does GMO, GMO, non-GMO, and uh, organic corn. Uh, it's a, it's essentially um, a dry corn mill. So, uh, flours, grits. What else? Meal. Meal. Yeah, I think Jiffy would be a big customer of theirs. So if you buy Jiffy corn meal. Uh, it's coming out of that plant, or a good chance it is. Uh, here in Wisconsin, uh, we have a flax cleaning facility uh, and processing, I should say, facility. It's uh, just up the road in uh, Sheboygan, in that area. Uh, don't ask me why a flax cleaning facility or processing facility is in uh, the middle of Wisconsin, but uh, it, it has been a good uh, add to our um, vision of being a very health conscious company and staying on the front of that line. Um, today, Grain Millers is a leading international ag agribusiness with diversified interests in whole grain manufacturing and merchandising. We do have a dairy trading uh, division as well. Um, it's more of a risk management type of company, so we take physicals and then we also work on the on the board of trade as well with those products uh, we are the world's largest organic processor um, organic oat processor and we're North America's second largest industrial oat processor and that flips back and forth from year to year on who gets the business is very close so um, so yeah we mill a lot of oats we operate out of seven locations in three countries and employ over <coughs> 700 uniquely talented people uh, we're committed to providing the safe, the safest and highest quality food products and the best possible customer service to our clients and consumers. Uh, here's a, a list of our locations. Um, so we're spread out pretty well. Um, the dots on the map aren't real accurate, but uh, you'll get the gist of it. So I forgot to mention we do have a, a a company that we own 60% of, uh, and that company essentially takes raw ingredients and then makes them into bars. So like Quaker Chewy bars, Cliff bars, uh, we actually make those bars as well and put them into packages. So, uh, and, and I'll be honest with you, sometimes that company doesn't buy 100% of their oats from us. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's kind of funny. They do buy a lot of oats from us, but, uh, they do buy ingredients for um, uh, from other companies, blend them, make them into the bars, and then they end up on the store shelf after that. Or 
that company is called Northern Gold, and they actually just opened another facility in Toronto. Uh, this is just a list of the grains that we buy. Uh, we buy more grains than this, but these are the ones that are the highest volume, biggest movers for us. Oats would be number one, corn would probably be number two, and I'd probably go into barley after that, and what's not listed on here is flax. Flax probably is a, a solid number four. So um, we're not a wheat mill per se, because most of our wheat ends up getting rolled, cut, and flaked. Um, same with rye and triticale. So we're not in the flour business. Uh, we do make flowers, but that's not our specialty. Uh, here's a picture of all of our facilities, our milling facilities, that is. Starting with uh, Eugene, Oregon, that was our first mill, uh, and then if you go Kitty Corner across over to St. Ansgar, Iowa, that, I mean, nobody else from Grain Millers is probably listening. We'd call that our flagship mill. It really is uh, one of the, the largest and one of the most advanced oat milling facilities in North America, maybe even the world. Um, so then we'll go down to Newton, Wisconsin. That's our flax milling facility. Um, yeah, those uh, harvester silos are full of flax. Um, we do move a little bit of oats through there as well, just trade them into the local feed market to the local dairies. Uh, if we go to the left, Marion, Indiana, that is our corn facility. I believe that actually looks quite a bit different now with the expansions that we've uh, put to it. So. There's, I think there's probably double the bins there. Uh, and then Eugene, you can see Eugene is our oldest and probably our smallest. Well, it is our smallest oat mill, but that is landlocked, so our expansion on that mill would have to happen somewhere outside of Eugene. Um, and then Yorkton was actually an oat mill when we bought it, but looked nothing like that. Uh, and actually, there's probably double, maybe even three times the bins there now. So, I said this before, but we're a company that really reinvests into the business and uh, in the long-term um, vision of what our company is going to be and who we are. And this is where I pass it over to the boss, Bruce Roskins. Not the boss, thanks. Um, I've been with Grain Millers now for almost four years, three and a half uh, to four years. I spent 37 years with a competitor, uh, Quaker Oats, before that. I'm an agronomist by training. I am passionate about oats production, though. I think uh, we're just once again starting to understand the benefits of oats in a crop rotation. Uh, even the, in fact, I was just down in Springfield, Illinois at a, a uh, crops update there on Wednesday and now they're starting to understand that we just can't continuously do corn on corn on corn beans on beans you know corn on, and bean rotation <clears throat> oats have a lot of benefits in a rotation uh, they even discussed Wednesday now they found out that uh, having oats with a legume in a crop rotation is controlling a lot of the uh, soybean cyst nematode problems that they've got in the southern states as well as sudden death syndrome. So we know there's a benefit to this rotation and I think this is stuff that some of the organic people have known for a long time uh, and now some of the conventional farmers are just catching on. But as I always tell farmers, these aren't, these, these aren't your father's oats anymore. Uh, in the 40 plus years I've been working on oats as a researcher, as an agronomist, as a plant breeder, I've worked very closely with the uh, University of Wisconsin here on their oat breeding program. And I'm happy to say they now have a full-time oat breeder again on staff, uh, which is wonderful. Uh, Wisconsin has been either number one, number two, or number three in oats production in the U.S. for many, many, many years as long as my career. But historically, 90% of the oats never leave the farm primarily because it's been a dairy feed, you know, either a forage or a straw source or as a good high quality. And you do realize oats are the highest protein cereal grain available. Therefore, it's always been very good at baby pig rations as well as in dairy rations as well. 
But we always say that to understand and to optimize the field yields in oats, you need to have a strategy. This is, you know, for years, oats have been the Rodney Danger field of the crops. They get the no respect, you know, on, a, on as a crop. You have to have a strategy with it just like any other crop, and that includes a field selection. You know, you, I prefer to see oats go on to like a soybean field or a field that has actually been plowed because uh, oats germinate at about 45 degrees Fahrenheit. So they will germinate before wheat, before barley, and in fact, before a lot of the weed seeds. So if you can get the oats in early, get a good seed bed uh, established, get them up, you can choke out a lot of weeds. And this is one of the benefits of having oats in a, in a particularly an organic uh, situation. Variety selection, all varieties are not equal. Not only do they vary in uh, maturity, they vary in their resistance to the primary diseases we have here in Wisconsin, that being crown rust, uh, a little bit of stem rust, but barley yellow dwarf. And continuously, we have to have new varieties to, to offset the fact that these diseases are mutating every year. A weed control strategy, the best weed control in oats is early planting, literally, and, in, and getting a good seed bed. So for the conventional farmer, yeah, the 2,4-D amines, the uh, MCPAs, even a Banville on the amine form does work as a good herbicide for broadleaf weed control, but you need to hit them early. Unfortunately, the majority of people that have got oats see that, you know, oats at about uh, two foot, two and a half foot tall, and all of a sudden there's a Canadian thistle that'll stick its head through, or another broadleaf weed. That's too late. You really need to be out there before the fourth leaf stage of the oat to have effective weed control. Harvesting and storage, I'm going to get into that a little bit more uh, because, quite honestly, a lot of farmers can raise good oats. Only about half of them can market good quality oats, and that's because they forget about the fact that this is a living, breathing grain, and once you put it in the bin, it's not like putting money in the bank. You've got a living organism there that you have to manage going forward. And then a marketing strategy. Uh, again, the biggest fallacy with a lot of oat production and why when you have an ag economist or a banker come in and talk to you about crop budgets and economic budgets, we tend as farmers to sell corn three, four, five times a year in pieces. The average time, the most common time for a farmer to want to sell oats is right off the combine. When is the lowest price of the year? Right off the combine. So in inherently, oats always looks the worst. And you will see basis changes. You will see the board. You will see carry in that board. You need to have a marketing strategy going forward. Let's see if I can get this to move. Field selection, again, we don't have a big wild oat problem, but you want to field, select a field that's uh, free of wild oats. Minimum herbicide carryover. Now, for the younger people in, in the audience here, you don't remember the problems we had with the triazines like atrazine, trifluralin, treflan, those carryover, or those synergistic compounds that literally the oats would get about four inches tall and keel over dead or in a doornail. That was a big problem here in Wisconsin 15 years ago. Today with glyphosate, which doesn't have soil activity, we've gotten through a lot of that. But as we now go into some of these crop rotations where they're starting to tank mix the glyphosate or the glyphosinates with other materials, you've got to watch for the residues because oats is a very deep rooted, matter of fact, it's the most deeply rooted cereal grain of any of them. It'll go deep, it'll mine that, and it can hurt uh, not only the yield, but also the quality of the oats. Um, I don't recommend putting oats in following a wheat crop or another cereal for a couple of reasons. One, the rooting situation. Number two, the disease uh, cycle uh, problem. And just inherently, you will find your best yields on oats following a row crop, particularly soybeans or canola or something like that. Got to keep moving. Here's the varieties that we're recommending this year. Uh, good Wisconsin line badger, uh, spurs, sabers out of Illinois. Earlier, you know, for the for the farmer that wants an earlier oat, 
Dion's a new one out of Minnesota, named for one of my colleagues, Dion Stuthman, uh, the retired uh, oat breeder over there. A fairly full season, but a, probably the best crown rust resistant variety we've got out there. Uh, a couple of them out of South Dakota, Hayden and Shelby 427, very good yielders, uh, adequate crown rust resistance. Newberg and Rockford out of North Dakota, fuller season varieties, particularly for the guy that wants the combination, maybe forage, uh, maybe feed, along with the milling out. Other lines, there's a new one here in Wisconsin that we have on our acceptable list simply because we haven't had enough of it yet that we can really test it. It's called Beta Gene. And as you can imagine by the name, it's high beta glucan. And beta glucan is that heart health element that the, a variety has to have at least 4% beta glucan in it for us to be able to make the heart health claim that all oat products can have if they've got that high beta glucan. <coughs> Uh, cold out of, out of Illinois, Horsepower, another one out of South Dakota, TAC, Illinois, Sewers out of North Dakota, and Excel out of Purdue. Those are our recommenda recommendations for this year for a milling quality oat. As far as fertility, we don't have time to get into all of this. Uh, understand that oats is does require a good balanced, and the key is balanced fertility. A lot of farmers will tell you I can't put uh, nitrogen on oats. Yes, you can, but you just have to make sure you've got enough phosphorus and potassium to balance that out. Nitrogen's responsible for that tall growth. It's responsible for the dark green color. It's responsible for protein. Phosphorus is responsible for the straw strength and the deep rooting. And potassium you know, on those days when it gets to be 95 to 100 degrees in July <clears throat> and all of a sudden that crop withers, potassium is the plant element that controls the opening and closing of the stoma on the bottom of those leaves. If you rob a plant of potassium or tie it up, and that's what usually happens <clears throat> with too much nitrogen or whatever, we tie up the available uh, potassium, that plant will literally stress itself or sweat itself much faster. The main effect you'll see from that is lower test weights. Harvesting and storage. Not a lot of farmers want to take the time to swath the crop anymore. You know, that's an extra step. Plus, what if it rains when I got it laying in the swath? Um, and today, if you go to, I don't care what uh, manufacturer of combines, Try to find the section on harvesting oats. You're not going to find it. It's just not there. These machines are designed for corn and soy and for putting or for eating acres fast. Um, if you can harvest malt quality barley, you can harvest good quality oats. Um, we say for swathing to, to not swath when oats are over 25% moisture. Uh, take them lower than that if you if you can. The thing to remember, if you've got wheat or barley in your rotation, oats is opposite of wheat or barley. Wheat and barley dry from the bottom up. Oats dries from the top down. Also remember with that panicle, that type of the head, which is like a shaped like a Christmas tree on an oat plant versus the spike on barley or wheat. You want to make sure that the bottom of that panicle is ripe and mature very little green. The little point of attachment called the peduncle where the head attaches to the stem, you want that to turn brown. Way too many farmers are cutting in green, then they're having problems number one with test weight, number two they're having trouble with storage of the oats. Remember 90 percent of your yield, 90 percent of your oats is in the bottom two-thirds of that panicle, so you want that dry. Um, with combining, I have recommend you take as much out of the field as you possibly can. I have honestly had farmers, true story, uh, last year in Iowa, harvest about 32, 33 pound test weight oats. Let it set in the bin for six weeks. Take the header off the combine, drive that combine up to the bin, set down the concave clearances a little bit tighter, turn up the air speed, turn up the cylinder speed, and pick up three to four pounds in test weight. That is necessary for good, clean oats. 
you lose the material right there on the on the farmstead where you can feed it if you want to. The target moisture that you want for safe storage is 12 to 13 percent moisture. Oats take a lot of air because of that hull. Turn up as much air on oats as you possibly can to keep them cool and sweet. If you have to dry oats, do not heat them over about 110 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the same thing that we say for malt barley, the same thing we say for milling quality corn. You get it over about 110 degrees Fahrenheit, you run the risk of fire, number one, because of that hull, but also uh, degradation of the quality, heat damage, and that sort of thing. How many of you have seen these grain bags out on the edges of fields now or on farmsteads? Don't use them for milling quality for food grade grain, please. You know, they're great if they stay anaerobic as they're designed to do, but I don't know any field that doesn't have a mouse or doesn't have some deer come up. They got to be very popular in Canada, particularly northern Saskatchewan where they have bears. I call them self-feeders. They literally are. And as soon as you open those bags up, the degradation starts, particularly if you've got moisture over that 12 to 13, which typically they will be. The other thing to remember, whether you've got a big grain bin like this, you know, which I call essentially a, a crock pot or one of these long tubes, on a day like today when it's going to get above freezing and then very cold at night, tomorrow even warmer, <coughs> cold again at night, and then next week get very cold, up to one foot inside of that south side of that grain bin, you can have 7 degrees Fahrenheit variation in the grain temperature. That's exactly what you need to have to form condensation. So I've had a lot of farmers harvest really good quality grain, oats, wheat, corn, whatever, put it in the bin. Yeah, it was a little bit damp, a little bit tough like it was last year at harvest, but you know, I'll let air dry it. Turn on the fans in the spring and they got mold or they can't run the, the augers in the spring. Remember, anything that's going to grain millers, anything that's going to go to a wheat mill, uh, it's intended to go into somebody's mouth. So as we tell you, if it's good enough that your grain is good enough that you put in your mouth, or more importantly, the mouths of your children, they're good enough uh, to sell to us. Otherwise, you've got to feed. This is what a kernel of oats looks like. You can see that uh, you know it's got a hull around it. Actually, there's two sets of hulls around oats. There's the glooms when it's still on the plant, which is where, fortunately, if you have it in an area where there's a lot of fusarium, and of course, corn and wheat, both the residue of that contain billions of spores of fusarium that causes the deoxynevalenol, the scab, or the, or the toxins. Most of that on oats stays on that gloom on the outside. What we're showing here, though, is actually the lemon, the palea. This is a cross-section of a kernel of oat, and it's actually two pieces of hull. There's like the canoe-shaped piece called the lemma. That's where the groat lays in. And then the palea, the little portion on the top here, that lays in over across the top. We work with the breeders to make sure that these little hooks aren't too deep on that and that we can take that lemma and that paley off. Literally that's all we're doing in the in the uh, in the process in the first steps of the processing is moving that uh, or removing that lemma and that paleo. Sam, do you want to go through the purchasing specs and then the and then the milling? Okay, so um this is uh, the spec that we put out to all of our farmers. Uh, you sign a contract uh, saying these are the, the specs that you're going to adhere to. Um, so, actually in reading some of this, we have updated a little bit, but 38 pound test weight, we, that's our goal. Um, really, we like 40 pounds. Uh, on average, every year, our U.S. oats are 38. Uh, for the last three, four years, our average for all the oats that we buy in the U.S., it's 38. 13.5% um, moisture. Um, typically, we do have a low end as well uh, at 10%. Uh, I'll start with the high end. Uh, for 
after 14 percent we start to lose milling yields so if if it comes in higher than that which we aren't going to let it come in higher than that so at that point you either have to dry it on farm or we have uh, a neighbor that can dry it for you uh, which would be done at your cost uh, on the low end if it gets below 10 percent the grain hits the roller mills and shatters and now we can't make you know the flakes that we were looking for uh, one percent wheat allowed maximum two percent other other grains essentially uh, wild oats our spec is one percent on organic uh, we take as high as five um, in Canada we see that limit get hit quite often or often enough uh, that probably is one of our biggest um, enemies I guess as far as uh, weeds go that in Canada thistle uh, barley 1%, which would fall underneath the max 2% other grains. 0.5% max canola, again, would fall in the max 2% other grains. 8% um, dehull oats allowed on organic. I'm trying to think. No, 8% dehull. I'm thinking of something else. Uh, the reason why we, we want the hull on there is because our equipment is set up to dehull. Uh, so if there's a lot of dehulls in the uh, in the grain, a lot of that could end up in our in our thins slash feed bins. So we lose yield there. It's also a food safety issue as far as stability with the grain as well. Uh, Twelve percent small oats. That's your thins or otherwise known as pin oats. Uh, the reason why we have a spec on that is again our system set up to take the hull off and then to roll in flakes. So the smaller the oat, the the more likelihood that the grain's going to fall through and we're not going to be able to make a, a flake out of it. Uh, and we we do take up to 20%. That's a crazy high spec, but you'd be shocked at how many times or at how many times we see a 20 plus percent uh, uh, truck come in. And, and there's ways around that too because you can clean them out um, pretty easily actually. 0.1% uh, heat damage. Uh, this is Honestly, if you, if you have heat damage, it's just going to throw your whole bin off. You're going to have off smelling, off smells coming out of that bin. Um, and who wants to eat musty oatmeal? Uh, Form material, 2%. Uh, max, 3%. With organic, we are actually have that increase up to 5%. 0.02% um, ergot maximum. Uh, ergot is... Well, it's a hallucinogen, so you don't want to have too much of that, right? Um, all other grain, Miller analysis and discount supply. I think, oh, insects. That's a big one here in the U.S. because you're taking off your grain in the heart of, uh, of when bugs are going to be the most active. So you'll definitely have a problem with, uh, with bugs. And we have ways around that, too, actually. Uh, this works 100% of the time on the first try, but loading your grain with a grain vac will get the bugs out of them. Uh, it is crazy, but it's something that we've found out, and we've bought our neighbor two grain vacs now because it works that well. And anything that comes in with bugs, it goes over to him, he vacs it, puts it back onto the truck, comes in, no bugs. And Bruce is going to explain why those are important. If you were so, yes. What are the screen sizes that you recommend? Is well, your 564 by three quarter inch slotted is the, is the most Perfect. important one. Okay. Uh, a lot of times, just your small triangulars to take out the small weed seeds. You know, takes a lot of the material out. Uh, I'm a believer not only the sieves and the screens though, but also air. The more air you can have on it, the more chaff you can take off. You do want to be careful. You know, uh, particularly in the a braiding of it, you know, where we're talking about that 8% dehulled. If you get too many dehulled, when as soon as you take the hull off of an oat, the enzymatic activity starts, particularly the peroxidase and tyrosinase and some of those enzymes that make things want to sprout, number one, and number two, it turns it rancid. So as soon as you take the hull off, if you have too much of a percentage of that that's already dehulled in your process, or that's one of the reasons why you know, we buy oats in Canada, we buy it all over the U.S., why don't we just ship the groats? You know, volume-wise, it would be a lot more efficient for us, right? 
but as soon as you take that hull off, you'll wind up with some with some problems. We've got another question about cleaning. Someone online wants to have further explanation about the bug cleaning, about how the vacuum. Uh, how does the the vac work on cleaning out the bugs? Yeah. You got to remember those bugs are very light in, in weight. So not only are you getting rid of some of the dust and the eggs and stuff from from some of the insects, uh, but you're getting rid of the the insects as well. It's just part of the the air system, uh, and because when you're when you're using a grain vac, it's vacuuming up and moving the heavier dense material and blowing off the chaff. And Very similar to a vacuum cleaner. Brings your test weight up. It does bring up your test weight. That's you know one of the little harvest aids that that uh, we encourage. Uh, way too many farmers think that you know I got to set take everything off that combine and try to sell it. It actually discounts you you know to do that. So clean the grain on the farm. Our fathers knew that for years ago. You know that's something that we need to to relearn. So in our cleaning systems, you know, this is a dry process. We're not making a slurry. This is not an ethanol plant where we're grinding everything and making, you know, extracting the starch and extracting the proteins or the, or the, uh, the alcohols. Everything that goes into that mill comes out one way or the other in a dry process. So we're taking the raw oats, or what we call green oats. We're taking off the screenings, again, with gravity and with air. Uh, we're separating out those light oats, which again, through that 560 force. We're taking off corn, soy, the sticks. Most of that's in aspiration. The seeds flow through, just like the old clipper fanning mills that Grandpa had on the farm or that are out there, you know, in the bins yet. Those things work great. You know, not only did they make good quality seed because all the grain was uniform, it's cleaning up all the crap that's in there. And again, remember that 90% of your plant disease problems and your weed seeds and your mycotoxins tend to be in the highest moisture and the highest oil portion of a grain sample. Guess what that is? Your weed seeds, your chaff. So, you, you know, I recommend for a farmer putting grain into the bin, clean it going in, clean it coming out you're going to have a lot better, you know, chance of making food grade materials and that's what a lot of the organic guys already know. So we wind up the, the biggest problem that we've got in cleaning it is trying to get that wheat and barley out. Now, the barley, you know, the wheat is a problem because we make gluten-free products. <coughs> and that portion of it if we have a kernel of wheat in there, that's a problem for us. The barley, the problem we run into there is you can't take the hull off the barley as easy as you can off of an oat. You have to grind it off, what they call purling it, abrading it off, grinding it down to get the hull off. If you have a nice barley kernel with a deep crease with that hull in there, and of course that's necessary for the malt process, you know, to malt a kernel of barley, you want a good crease, you want that hull in there to start the malt uh, activity. However, that sliver of hull that stays attached to that barley kernel when it goes through our flakers, which I'll show in a second here, that winds up as a little sliver. So when we get complaints about an oatmeal product that's got sticks or a sliver or something sharp in it, 90% of the time it's going to be a little shard of a barley hull in it. So to dehull the oat, we literally use a impact dehulling equipment, which drops the oats into the top into an impeller, spins it out against either a ceramic or a rubber ring. The fat end of the oat, the germ end, hits that rubber ring. The hull opens up that lemon, that paleo that I showed you, split open. Aspiration takes those hulls off, which goes to our fiber plant or goes to our feed uh, portion. The raw oat dehulled is called a groat. And that's where we get the raw groats. Then we have to kiln them because again, remember as soon as we take the hull off, the enzymes want to start. So we have to deactivate those enzymes by steaming them, steaming those groats, heating them up in a very controlled oven called a kiln with six stages in it, dropping those oats down through those stages, heating, ste or steaming, heating, heating a little more, starting the cooling down, and then we wind up with the groats. 
Now Sam at the start showed you the old-fashioned oatmeal, the instant oatmeal, the regular oatmeal. They're all the same oats. The only difference we, we have on it is in the flaking process. How thin do we, how long is it in that kiln, number one, for the steaming, number two, how thin do we roll those oats? An instant oat has got the same nutrition, the same quality as the steel cut oats. So regardless of what Oprah tries to tell you on TV about how more nutritious a steel cut oat is, they're all the same oats, regardless of who's manufacturing them. What's okay. the moisture in the box? In the box is usually around 9%. Yeah, you know, you want it down that, that low just because typically with a lot of oat products, they're in a paper bag or they're in a paper, uh, paper tube. They go in the pantry and they may sit there for three months. That's where some of your acidity issues and some of your bug problems can also happen. Uh, a lot of the old time, you know, our grandmas would tell you, you got a bag of oatmeal or a tube of oatmeal, you put it in the freezer. You know, keep it nice and dry. And again, uh, this is through the uh, steaming, the flaking, the cooling, the screening to get your different uh, sized oat products out of it then. And Sam, I'll turn it back to you for uh, some marketing. Well, we're, on, we're on the ended. clock. I do get <laughs> Yeah, fair enough. I'll, I can zoom through. There's not too much left here. Uh, okay, this is just a, uh, this is from our data, essentially, of what we've seen prices do through our uh, purchases uh, on organic uh, small grains. So uh, you can tell each, each uh, commodity has followed a, a very similar path. Uh, and, and actually, it also goes to show you uh, what the recession did to organic grain markets as well. So if the economy is doing well, organic grain is going to do well. Organic farming is going to do well. Uh, right now, we're in a period where the U.S. economy is doing very well. The rest of the world is uh, falling into the toilet. But um, it, it is a good time for uh, our organic grains, organic, uh, even organic dairy farming, produce, anything, you name it. It's a good time to be in it. Um, so, uh, wheat, wheat definitely, uh, went far, far and above where barley ever did. Um, but again, you'll see a, a very common path throughout there. So oats, if you look at it, uh, 2006, we were probably three fifty four dollars to now, uh, we float right around $7 delivered to our mill. Uh, in St. Ansgar, Iowa, you know, if you were to back freight off, it's about 50 cents a bushel from where we sit today to our mill in Iowa and, and really easy to get trucks to make that move. So a lot of our pricing we do picked up on your farm. So you don't have to look for a truck. We send our guys in there. Uh, they know the song and dance. You get the grain ready uh, to move and um, you'll get paid a price uh, sitting at your farm. Uh, Every once in a while, somebody will want to haul their own grain in. But to be honest with you, even though it's extra work for us, I would rather set the truck up because the truck knows that it has to be sealed. He knows it's got to be cleaned. Uh, we just have a little bit more control over it uh, so we don't have any issues at our, at our mill. And, and some of them are good enough where they, they can see problems as you're loading. So they're very good that way. Um, you know, I think pricing where we're at here today is going to be uh, fairly stable. Um, we're seeing the feed markets fall apart on organic because of imports coming in from uh, Eastern Europe, Western Europe. Um, but the the food grade side of it seems to be holding pretty strong. So there's definitely premiums out there if you go the food grade route. Uh, this is just a quick map of our U.S. acres. Um, yeah, about 13, 14, and maybe even the year before is when we really started to focus on uh, the agronomy, and, and that's not short of, when did you start with us, Bruce, a couple years ago? 2012. 2012, yeah. So um, I'll, I'll say this. We, we've noticed a, a couple of things since 2012, 2013. We, we have a lot more focus on what guys are doing on farm, and it's allowed us to... Uh, get better quality, more consistent quality out of the U.S., and um, 
overall, it, it's allowed us to expand our acreage in the U.S. Uh, this is the U.S. production is roughly a seventh or so of, of what we buy. Uh, most of our organic oats come out of Canada, uh, some out of Eastern Europe uh, in the Baltic states. So I put Wisconsin on there and you can't see that dot. Um, that's because uh, most of the oats go into dairy feed if they're grown organically. Um, we, I just did the math this year, we probably have 600 acres uh, that's contracted already. So uh, I try like heck to, uh, to get them to grow for us. But again, it's an uphill battle because a lot of it ends up in the dairy feed. Um, I'm running out of time. Let's see. In the last couple of slides, about kind of advice for being a right there. Let's do that. If you want to finish that one, sure. I'll finish up with it. <clears throat> As we always tell farmers that they're raising a crop, and that's what they're good at. Remember that we're not buying the crop; we're buying a food ingredient. Therefore, you need to understand what we mean by a specification, by a grade by why we insist on what we do. Uh, if you understand that, it's a whole lot easier to achieve that through your entire process. And as I was telling Anders at the start of the, the session here, that's one of the hardest things for people to understand that particularly with organic, you're not raising just a crop, you're raising a process or you're into a process that's multiple year, you know, and multiple quality. So understand who the customer is our customer are all the organic food companies in the world. Understand our definition of quality. Understand and be able to document your capabilities better than your competitors. If you know what variety you got, if you can document what you've done to that field, what you did for quality improvement through the whole, through the whole process, you've eliminated 90% of your problems and you've answered 100% of the questions that a customer is going to want. Think the idea of an ingredient versus a commodity. Understand that value. It's more than just price. Sam quoted a 650 price. Understand the value of that crop, though, in that rotation, in that entire process, particularly on the organic side. And then be able to synchronize your product supply and capabilities to the customer. We can't take your whole crop at harvest. It's impossible. We need to buy it year-round. And to do that, we need to entrust you, the farmer, and we do buy all of our oats directly off the farm. We need to entrust the farmer to keep that grain as an ingredient during the year. There's premiums for that. You know, it's called the basis. It's called the carry in the market. Uh, but you need to understand how that fits into your system. You know, particularly, that's one of the benefits of a small grain and especially oats in a crop rotation. You're not, you're not selling those oats, you're not moving them all when you need to be in the field for corn or be in the, need to be in the field for one of the other crops. And with that, there's my contact information at the top. Um, I actually live in Naperville, Illinois, but I get to the Eden Prairie office where Sam's at once a month. I'll be up there again next week. Uh, Sam's in our office in Eden Prairie, Minnesota, which is our headquarters. Feel free to contact either one of us or contact Anders for more information. We actually have a new oat production manual that we put together that explains in a whole lot more depth uh, what we're trying to communicate. Uh, and it's new off the, off the press. I think the last time there was an oat manual written, it was 1973. And we, yeah, we have a, one of the small ones, and I have one of the actual uh, full-size ones here for Anders, uh, for those that, that want to look at it. It's free of charge. So. I can send that thing out in the email also. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Any other questions? Do you have for our students? All right. So we can let them go, but we can continue with questions with people in class and online. Just a couple wrap up for short course. I got a couple emails from you guys. That's awesome. That works just as well as in print. If I didn't get an email, I need your final assignment in my hands right now. Um, so Trent, but we talked about that. We're all good. Um, also, I just sent an email to you guys that has a link to a survey. So please take that survey. It's the last thing you have to do. It's not good today. That's the end. The final project. The final thing. Uh, so do your survey. Uh, it's been a pleasure having you guys. Do the survey. Do the survey. Do the survey. Okay. Do the survey. Okay. Do the survey. Do the survey.
And I see we've got one question online here. If a truck's rejected for food grade, can it be sold for feed grade at St. Ansgar? Yes, it can. We don't take it into our plant, obviously, because that's a food grade facility. But uh, we've got a couple of outlets right outside of town there that we just direct you, or actually we do the marketing for you. Yeah, there's always a place for good food grade or uh, feed grade oats, unless, of course, it is so sour or something like that, and then you shouldn't have a truck under it in the first place. So, yes? What are the acceptable cover crops for seeding oats? Oh, yeah. cover crops before oats? Yeah, I mean, if you happen to plant cereal rye and it's yeah. plowing down, is that a no-no? No, no, it's, go, it's, it's, go over that? no it's not a no-no. I, I wouldn't like to see a winter wheat before oats. I have no problem with cereal rye whatsoever. Matter of fact, it is my preferred cover crop uh, that I, you know, think is one of the best because uh, it's not depleting the soil quite as much. I also like to see a radish or a turnip, you know, as a cover crop uh, in with that. Uh, oats does very well after that, you know, particularly in an organic situation. We've got uh, four or five farmers in north central Iowa that are ex doing exactly that, a cereal rye with a radish or, or something like that, plowing it, planting the oats, and uh, getting very, very good results with it. Um, the cereal rye is not going to be a, a harbinger for the fusarium diseases and things like that. Uh, we got a couple questions online. All right. Uh, the most recent one is from Wendy. If a truck is rejected, did you just get that one? I just one? got that oh, one. You just got that one. Okay, great. Um, we got the bugs question. Uh, we got the what size screen. In an average year, how many truckloads do you reject? On organic or conventional? Organic. Organic. Sam, I'll let you feel that. It's five, five, under 5%. Five <coughs> under 5%, yeah, that's what I was going to guess because, again, we do have that feed market available and stuff. We've always got some, you know, we've got a trading group so that if we can't unload it there, we've, we've actually, very, very fortunate, we have a farmer right on the south edge of town that's got all of this cleaning apparatus, all these bins, and he's done very well in cleaning a lot of the grain, you know, if it's a little bit of foreign material or something like that, or the bugs, we can send it down to Donnie. Donnie does a miraculous job of cleaning that up and moving it on. As far as the actual rejects, though, on an organic, you know, that's going to have to be something that we just simply can't use for human food production. Yeah, that's, that's not trucks. That's like 5% of our production contracts that don't make it. So if it, usually we reject it before it even leaves the farm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, that's, and that's something I should have touched on. Thanks for reminding me, Sam. We do suggest strongly that after the farmer harvests the grain, send us a sample. Mm -hmm. We'll do a grade. We, we don't want you sending it and getting in truck lines and, you know, and paying freight and stuff like that, or we don't want to pay freight and get it there and have it rejected. We want to take a sample. We still, because of FDA food grade laws, have to grade that truck in a secure facility on our plant when it gets there. You know, and we pop the seals and open that tarp and, and do the probing and stuff. We have to do that because it's food and drug uh, controlled. But we want to make sure you've got a good chance of getting that that uh, truck accepted before it ever gets to our facility. What's the price discount, feed versus food grade? Can you repeat that question too? Uh, the question is the difference differential between feed and food grade. Sam? So on, on a typical year, uh, up up until this year, usually it was like a buck to a buck fifty under, uh, but the milling price has uh, steadily increased and the feed price has steadily either stayed flat or gone down so this year we bought our feed oats anywhere from 375 delivered to St. Ansgar, Iowa to we started out maybe at 450 uh, once it gets anything north of four it gets really hard to market uh, in this marketplace and I think actually it might might continue to stay that way the way the feed market's been going so you know you, you could have had a contract for seven dollars on the food side and you got paid for 450 which still is a, a heck of a deal compared to the two dollars you probably would have got on the conventional side but it, that is the lowest we've seen on the feed side in maybe four years so uh, but at the end of the day it's still a market and you're still able to move it and and, and the thing about that is is that we we're going to offer you that price. If you're a contract holder and you don't make food grade, I'm going to offer you that price. And 
if you don't like it, you don't have to sell it to me. At that point, I just care that you, you get the most money for it that you can. So I, I, I don't really want to even be in the feed side of it. We're just there as a service for somebody who signed a contract with us that we can provide that service and market that grain for you. But if you've got a better local market, you're free and clear of that contract and you can sell it to whoever you want. So, uh, so if, you, if you don't make grade, you're not penalized. Is that what you said? Well, you're not, you're not, you're penalized because you don't get you're going to get a less, lesser price, but yeah, I'm not going to come after you. Like you, you don't have to, you don't have to supply that volume to us, which that, that's high risk for us. I mean, honestly, like we sw we see swings of a you know a half a million bushels a year because in our position because of if we have a, a an area that's drought droughted out or area of bad disease, you know we're expecting seventy five bushel an acre, and that whole area got fifty bushel an acre. So now I have to go out and say, oh well, where am I going to find that balance? Because uh, we're not going to come after the farmers for it. So. And it's with organic, it's like, what are you going to do as a farmer, right? You have to wait till the next crop year. You can't grow another crop. So. The only person that wins in a legal battle with an organic farmer is the lawyer. Yeah, that's a fact. What are relative <laughs> yields that you've seen I, on the organic side? The question yeah. was about relative yields in organic. Yeah, do you, you can jump sure. on it. Sure. Um, the average yield, I'll, I'll just use Iowa. Last week was the uh, Practical Farmers of Iowa seminar that I spoke at, and the average yield there from, from uh, the farmers that I talked to on oats was 80 to 85 bushel per acre, which is actually higher than the Wisconsin state average yield for conventional oats. You know, So the organic farmers are doing a, a very good job with it. Was that just last year, though? That was last year. Yeah. I'd say last year was a good year. year. Yeah. yeah. Last year was a really good year. Um, you know, 65 <laughs> to 85 bushel per acre with no inputs. You know, it is more typical, uh, but last year, good yields, 85 bushel. We had guys beat 100 bushel last year, particularly the, those guys in central Iowa I was talking about that were following a cover crop, you know, with very good fertility. That's Wright County, Iowa, you know, central Iowa with very flat. Uh, their biggest problem was too much water last year. Good question. Very good. Go for it. Do you have anything in place to give a premium to a transitional guy to try to get his business as organic? We, we offer 15 cents. Yeah, uh, right now, it, it's not it's nothing to brag about, but we, we're about 15 cents over what we'd bid a normal conventional producer. But I'll, I'll be honest, uh, if I had to pick a bad time to transition, right now probably... <laughs> isn't a great time to transition because the conventional market is so low in the same breath um there there is a pot of i probably shouldn't say a pot of gold but there is light at the end of the tunnel where your organic markets seem to be thriving um so if you can make it through those three years of transition it's uh it's good but um yeah it's 15 cents right now. There are some companies that offer transition prices for corn and beans as well, but for oats, it's 15 cents over the market. Okay. Yep. Do you have anybody that's grow? I read an article about in Canada they're growing naked oats that hold themselves within the combine and right to your bowl. Is that not what you're looking for? Was that, that that's not, yeah. The question was about naked oats that kind of hold themselves in the combine. Yeah, there's been talk about that for over 40 years that I've been in this industry. <laughs> um, and every once in a while you'll see somebody come in, you know, that, there's one company in Manitoba that calls it the rice of the prairies, you know, trying to market it. Good marketing. Uh, we actually thought that uh, there might have been some hope for that about four years ago. Campbell Soup was interested in putting more oat in their uh, product instead of some of the barley uh, when malt barley prices were very high didn't work out. The The quality's just not there. When you've got a naked oat, it's a little bit softer uh, and it breaks up, it, it damages, the rancidity issues are there. You know, Mother Nature put, uh, you know, God put that hull around that oat groat for a reason and we haven't figured out how to get rid of it yet, you know, in the field. Mm -hmm. So, um, you mentioned the problems with the groats if they get to that point. 
are we better off then on the farm level running it through a gravity deck if we have one and oh absolutely using that to feed pigs and if other things and yeah repeat that question also. uh the question is you know are you better off using a gravity deck and uh, some air to clean the oats up as far as the feed and that sort of thing yes very definitely now if you're into you know doing feeder pigs or something like that uh a, a dehulling operation can work, but you need to feed that pretty quick. I mean, you don't leave that set for a week in the bin or whatever, or the, the pigs aren't going to eat it either. You know, they're, they're going to smell that rancidity issue and it stuff start. It does change that fast. You know, in the summer, in the winter like this, no, not necessarily. But, uh, you know, it's it's the same thing we talk about with some of these old granaries and stuff out there. These old, you know, the, the best bin in the world to store any grain in was a wooden bin because it breathed. You know, it would breathe versus these steel crock pots we got out there today uh, or, the or you know, the, the bags. But at the same point in time, that aroma from any de degrading grain lingers in those bins for years. You know, same thing will happen with the degraded uh, oat. We got a question online, and then we can get to Matt. Um, this question is: Does GM hold grain over a year, or are there regulate grain millers, uh, or are there regulations that don't allow food manufacturers to hold organic grain over a year? <coughs> there are no federal regs in place. I can tell you that we will not. You know, we we don't want to see grain that's over a year old. You know, we tell we we specify right in our contracts that we want this year's grain and stuff. Uh, it, it isn't necessarily due to the degradation of the grain so much from a nutritional standpoint or a rancidity standpoint. Grain over a year tends to have had moisture variances in it. It's gotten damper, it's gotten drier, and the bugs start. And we can clean out the bugs. The problem is getting rid of the eggs and stuff with it. On the production side in the field, have you seen any advantage to yield or weed pressure by running a time meter across an old field? A lot of work's been done in Saskatchewan by Dr. Steve Shirtliff. Uh, depends. He's done it both oriented with the row and against the row. The time uh, weeder has done a fairly good job. Part of it depends upon the pressure. You definitely want to do it about the second leaf stage to third leaf stage. A lot of guys wait too long, you know, to go in there. Uh, I've seen a rotary hoe, actually, at the at the two leaf stage, do a fairly effective job of flipping out that little kochia, you know, or one of those weed uh, broadleaf weeds, flipping it out pretty well. You're going to lose maybe 10% of your stand in doing it, but remember, at that two leaf stage, yet those oats will still tiller, they'll still stool. And you'll and you'll uh, get some benefit uh, from that. Uh, row spacing is a big question right now. The machinery manufacturers, of course, want to sell you bigger machinery and are pushing nine inch and even eleven inch row spacings, or fifteens and do your soybeans as well. I don't like that. You know, the more ground cover you can get early in the season, particularly with organic, the better. I like sevens, or if you're going to go nine with maybe like the Borgo drills that have got the two feeders on, on each one, those work very well. Uh, same thing with your variety selections. I like a variety that's very, that germinates obviously quickly, but also has a lot of viability and it's got a little more ground cover because the best weed control is to shade that ground, shade out those uh, weed seeds and stuff before they germinate. It's seeding rate. Seeding rate, um, the old rule of thumb of two and a half to three bushel per acre, but really there's a website, and it's in our manual as well, look at the formula, because I can tell you there's going to be a, a weight difference and a bushel difference between, for instance, a badger and a colt oat. Those colts, you know, some of those varieties are going to have a lot more seeds in a pound than... than <coughs> The, the beta gene that's a longer, skinnier kernel and stuff. So use that formula, figure out what your thousand kernel weight is. You want to try to achieve an 18 to 23 plants per square foot final stand. Or about 20, in, in a seven inch row, about 20 plants or whatever. Fuller feeding with fish and other biologicals, is that a benefit with oats or is there a response? I wish we knew more. You know, the question is uh, foliar feeding of the oats. Uh, yes, 
feed it early. Um, nitrogen is very important at the, you know, up to the fourth leaf stage on oats, but you can overdo and wind up with some standability issues. Uh, I'm really hoping that, you know, through the work here now at Wisconsin and with the Practical Farmers of Iowa, we can understand more about some of the biologics, not only on the fertility side, but also on some of the fungicide effects of some of these. There's, there's a world of information we don't know. So chili and nitrate's acceptable? Yes. So if you're okay. So you don't yeah. sell into Canada? Um, we've got a mill up there. Oh, you know, segregate it. Yeah. Yeah. And the oats would never go north. The, the product oh. doesn't go north. I mean, even the, the mills up there go south. Everything goes south. Yeah. Sure. Have you seen an advantage or disadvantage to someone trying to put their oats in a seven inch row and then broadcasting behind or a full broadcast and just work it in? Is there anything? There's as many benefit. The question is about broadcasting after uh, drilling the oats in. Yeah, I've, I've seen everything work mm -hmm. you know and it it depends upon the moisture uh, at the particular time um the, the the best inherently on average is where you put the the under seating or whatever at the same time um if you've got a very cold wet spring like we had last year in illinois as an example the farmers that did a small grain uh, did a small grain and then did an underseeding. The underseeding actually took off faster than what the, the small grain did, and they wound up with, for instance, red clover that was almost as tall as the oats, you know, and stuff on it. But that was a timing factor of the very slow growth of the small grain. You know, their situation would have been better get the small grain established and then go in with the underseeding. So there's a question online about experience planting oats oh, into frost seeded red clover. So any further thoughts on that under seeding? Uh, it's Just worked. On that. Again, it's all weather dependent. You know, if you, if you, I like frost seeding, I, I really do, providing you have a normal season and things warm up after that. You define normal as you will, you know, but last year was not a normal year because we had a very cold soils and very cold spring on it. It probably would not have worked real well where I live in in northern Illinois. I mean, the, the earlier, like the earlier, the better. Though. Yeah, the earlier the better. Oats are very resilient. Yeah, they are. You know, I've seen them frozen off up to the. You got to remember, the growing point with oats is at or below ground level up until the fourth leaf stage. So that's a foot tall. You can hit it with a herbicide, a freeze, mechanical damage. The oats is going to stool out and it's going to come back. After the fourth leaf stage, though, that's where that panicle primordium begins moving up that stem. And any stress you put on it, temperature, moisture, herbicide, whatever stress is going to affect how many kernels are going to emerge at the top at that point in time. Fall forage oats with a medium red can give you a lot of uh, animal unit gain, um, but would you recommend not following it again in the spring with another oat crop if you did something? No, like that, that oats on oats like that is, is okay. We've seen some of that done. Uh, 2013, uh, you couldn't find hardly oats around because guys were doing exactly that. They wanted a cover crop and they wanted something to put in with that radish or that turnip or something like that. They were selling 19 pound oats. You know, holes are 18 pounds, so they weren't even good oats and stuff, but they were selling them in these mixes and stuff. Then, as long you know, the oats is going to die anyway. We're playing with winter oats. Matter of fact, we, we just met with the oat breeder here at noon today. We want to talk about the idea of winter oats this far north, but we're not, <coughs> not anywhere close to it today yet. So you could follow, uh, you know, the oats are going to die out completely anyway. So you could do that. I'd be more worried about something that's going to carry a fusarium, you know, or something like that, like a wheat. Is it going to be challenging to get oats into that uh, medium red clover, uh, for example? Or? Well, any time you try to go through that dense a canopy or that dense a root system, yeah, you've got to have a pretty good pretty good drill to get it done. You can't aerial seed oats on top of a red clover and expect to get decent germination. It's not going to happen. And fall rye planted, and then the need to get oats in very early, are we talking about full clean tillage with a moldboard plow, 
or has some of the high speed discs and other things that are out today allowed you to prep it much faster and get the oats planted? Uh, it's, it, it, is, it is possible. Now, that question. The, the question is, you know, if you've got a fall rye or whatever that's got pretty good growth and stuff, can you do some tillage? and still get the oats in and get it in early. Uh, we've seen that happen, uh, per particularly in Iowa, southern Minnesota, where we've seen that work. Where we haven't seen it work is where it's a very wet spring. 2013 was another example where that, oat, where that rye went all the way to heading. You know, the farmers had a devil of a time. They wound up literally, uh, a couple of guys that I know went in with a flail chopper and tried to chop it down and then incorporated the oats did not come up very well on that just because it was too late, too thick. And they didn't get those oats in until the, you know, middle to end of May. And that was too late. You know, theoretically, yeah, with the fall rye, if you can go in with a disc, if you can go in with, uh, I've seen rippers, you know, go in uh, the 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 spike tooth and then with the uh, the blade and then you know just tear it up uh, and then get the oats in yeah it works it works question yeah could in the fall seeded rice uh, at a moderate stand could you come in early with a no-till planter and plant the oats and then wait a little bit and then chop the rye off for feed before the competition becomes too great? You can take it off. I haven't seen a real good stand of the oats following that, though, okay. you know, just because of the uh, the timing of taking that, that rye and stuff <clears throat> off. Uh, typically, you're going to have an underseeding and stuff with that as well. Uh, you know, there's going to be a red clover or something like that, and you just don't get the stand because you've already got that, that uh, legume established. As far as budgets go, um, certainly people are going to look at corn, you know, or on the organic side for money. But let's say we're talking 100 bushel oats on the top side, you know, and we're talking $7 roughly, you know, so gross of 7 Can you talk to us about the input expenses side? Because maybe that's significantly cheaper than corn. Well, it is, you so know. typically what are producers doing? And, How's it turning out on a net we, income? Here, repeat that question. The, the question is on the economics of, uh, of a, an organic oat in comparison to, say, an organic corn or, or something like that. Um, we do contract grow organic corn, so I've got a little bit of experience with this. Essentially, your machinery cost is essentially the same, you know. Uh, we do recommend a little bit more on the fertility side, you know, on, on the... Uh, corn, so like a chicken litter or a turkey litter or something like that at a little heavier rate, or a lot of guys are knifing in, particularly like northern Illinois, northern Iowa, uh, hog manure and stuff into it, so there's a little bit more exp expense there. But the average organic corn uh, hybrid, 80,000 kernel, or a non-GMO approved by the organic is running around $285 a bag but you'll plant 2.2 acres. So you've got well over 100 bushel, or excuse me, $100 an acre just in your seed cost. Organic oat seed at two and a half bushel per acre at even if you bought certified seed, and we do recommend certified seed, you know, you've got maybe 20, 30 bucks there, you know, in your total uh, seeding application. Uh, whether you're conventional or organic, the cost of whatever the under seeding. I like red clover a lot. I think it does a lot for the for the soil. For the guy though that's into the dairy that maybe wants the uh, the alfalfa, you know, okay. you've got to figure that out. No chicken litter. No, I, I like I like chicken litter. I just don't you know I, I I like litter a lot. Turkey litter, chicken litter, because of the phosphorus benefit that's there as well. Really good standability a lot of times with your small grains you can get from you know. Uh, either fa uh, fall applied, spring applied, pre-plant, uh, or even I've seen some top dressing work at a very early stage on the oats. Any other questions in class? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Bruce and Sam.